I know this talk is called What We Eat Matters. But I want to add one word. I've jumped my slide so you can see it already. What we eat matters most. I'm going to start by asking for a couple of volunteers from the front row. I'm going to need three people who are willing to eat something from the front row. We've got one, two, need a third one, three. Okay. <laughs> Everyone's raised their hand. I was worried everyone would say no because they'd just eaten, but okay, let me get the contraband. Hold on. I wonder if anyone's ever done this in the UN before. A tiffin. Okay. Who was the first one? Was it you? Okay. Don't eat that just yet. <laughs> I'm not poisoning you, I promise. Second volunteer was somebody over here. <laughs> I think it was you two. That one's for you. You're the third, third one, right? Yep. <laughs> you look like you're regretting your choice. <laughs> okay, I have, I have napkins just in case. If you could pass these around, that would be great. Okay, so I'm going to let you guys dig into those. Um, and after you try them, we'll be best friends, I promise. Food is the best way to make friends. <laughs> so I want you to taste the two different burgers, and I want you to notice the taste difference. And I'm going to come back to you in about five minutes. When we talk about what actions we can take to personally reduce our impact on the planet, or what we can do to positively impact our future, the few, a few of the same things always seem to come up. Just watching these faces of everyone tasting. <laughs> the first one is switching your lights off or changing your light bulbs. The second one is taking shorter showers. Third one is Teslas, of course. And number four is handcuffing yourself to your local government building. But there's an elephant in the room that nobody is talking about. When we look at climate discussions like Conference of the Party, so that's COP26, COP27, this topic is rarely even mentioned during climate discussions. And actually, many people who were attending COP27 this year didn't even know that this subject was related to climate change at all. This elephant that no one seems to want to talk about is food. And by comparison, this elephant makes taking shorter showers or changing our light bulbs look like teeny tiny field mice in comparison to this ginormous problem. Okay, we're going to go back to these taste testers. Have you guys tried both burgers yet? So there, there was one burger and it had a light bun and the other burger had a darker bun. How did it taste? Amazing. Amazing? <laughs> both of them? Yeah. OK, that's good. What about you? What do you think? Yeah, I think both of them tasted really nice. OK, and you? Yeah, no, I was a fan of both of them. OK, that's good. Everyone's a fan. So one of those burgers was a beef burger. Can you guess which one? So there was the light bun and the dark bun. The one that didn't have sesame seeds. <laughs> the on. one that didn't have sauce. Yeah. Trying to remember sesame which one. Seeds oh, sesame seeds. seeds. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, I think that was the lighter bun. Yes. Yep. And can you guess which one was the beef burger? The darker bun. The darker bun. <laughs> I don't remember the color of the bun. You don't remember the color of the bun. <laughs> <laughs> um, the lighter bun. The lighter bun. Okay. I have a confession. I lied. <laughs> Both of those burgers were 100% plant based. Everything from the bread. A round of applause, amazing. <laughs> so you three, congratulations. You just participated in saving the planet. And a study carried out by Oxford University in 2018 showed us exactly that. Plants can, in fact, save the planet. 
The lead researcher in this study, Joseph Poor, actually said after the study was complete, and I quote, let me switch slides. A vegan diet is probably the single biggest way to reduce your impact on Earth. Not just greenhouse gases, but global acidification, eutrophication, land use, and water use. That is a pretty powerful statement. But I personally think that the idea that what we eat has an impact on the planet is really difficult to grasp. Like, how does unseasonal Bangkok rain, starving polar bears, or even poverty have to do with what I eat for breakfast? It just doesn't feel like it makes any sense. A few years ago, someone asked me a simple question that completely blew my mind and made me truly understand on a visual level why what we eat matters most. But first, I want to do some visualization with you guys. So close your eyes for a minute. I'm watching everybody, come on. <laughs> close your eyes. Right off the bat, I want you to visualize one billion objects. Can be any object you like. A billion tennis balls, a billion cupcakes, a billion phones, a billion cars, a billion unread emails. Actually, don't visualize that last one, that's disturbing. But anything else you can visualize. One billion. Okay, so think about your object. Really visualize it. One billion of that object. It's impossible, isn't it? You can open your eyes now. It's, it's pretty impossible to visualize a billion. How can we possibly comprehend that ginormous number? For me, the easiest way to visualize such a ginormous number is to imagine it in time. Let's say in seconds. Okay, I have more snacks. Here's a chance to win some vegan candy. I've got some vegan dinos, I think they are, in my pocket. <laughs> Snug them in, contraband again. And I want you guys to guess the closest number. So, how long do you think one billion seconds is? Can be in minutes, hours, days. Vegan candy for anyone who can guess the closest. I'm sure you're probably thinking, oh, I thought this was going to be about food and now we're doing maths. I promise, I'll get there. Okay, do we have any guesses? How long is one billion seconds, okay? 33 years. <laughs> Anybody else? 3.5 years. Anyone else? 1 billion seconds. Okay, I'm just going to skip to the answer then. You were very close. The answer is 31.7 years. Hold on, I do have candy, wait. Catch! Good catch. <laughs> That's pretty crazy, right? Think about a second. 31.7 years, constantly, every single second. That is a billion seconds. Really puts into perspective just how huge one billion actually is. Now, I want you to think about 70 billion. I'll explain the reason for this number in a second. So, I have more candy in my pocket. <laughs> Can anyone guess how long 70 billion seconds is? Any guesses? Can be a stab in the dark. No calculations, no Google. 210 years, anybody? No Google, I'm watching you, anyone on your phone? 185, 185 what, years? 185 years, any more guesses? Oh, where did that come from? Oh, sorry, say again. 270. Yeah. Okay. The answer, 70 billion seconds is 2,219 years. I can't remember who was the closest. Can anyone remember? No what was your guess? <laughs> no one was closest. Okay, find me after. I've got more. I'll give one to everyone. <laughs> so now, now that. Oh, I haven't skipped my slides. Sorry, hold on. 2,219 years. Now that is a big number. Okay, now we've had some fun with numbers. Let's go back to that connection between food and climate change. Let's go back to that question, that simple question that one person asked me a few years ago 
that completely blew my mind and truly put into perspective and made me understand on a visual level why what we eat matters most. This person asked me this simple question. What requires more resources? What would take a greater toll on our planet? Feeding 8 billion people or feeding 70 billion animals? This one question instantly made me visualize the problem in its entirety. 70 billion animals is how many land animals we raise and kill for food every single year. It's almost unfathomable. Think about how crazy that is. So try and put that into perspective. If we assign one second to every animal we raise for food in just one year, it would equal 2,219 years. Isn't that absolutely mind-blowing? I have to repeat that because even for me, I can't even visualize how many seconds are in one day, let alone 2,219 years. My mind is officially blown. But what does this have to do with climate change? So for this next part, I want you to use your imagination again. Sorry, this is a lot of imagining, isn't it? I swear this isn't some secret meditation class. I'll get to the point in a minute, I swear. So close your eyes again and imagine. If you're a pet owner, this might be slightly easier to picture, but bear with me. So let's say you go to an animal shelter and you decide to adopt a cow and take him home as a pet. It's a pretty big pet, I know, but bear with me. So let's call this cow Charlie. Charlie the cow. Now let's visualize what you would need to set up at home before you take Charlie home. Let's imagine you've set yourself up with pet supplies for one full year. So let's visualize what that really looks like. Now bear in mind, the average cow is approximately 20 times bigger than the average dog or 100 times bigger than the average cat. So first you're gonna to need to hop on Amazon and order Charlie's food. Picture how much food you'll need to order on Amazon, put in your Amazon cart for Charlie for one full year. Remember, 20 times bigger than the average dog, 100 times bigger than the average cat. Sounds expensive, doesn't it? <laughs> now imagine how much space Charlie's gonna need. I don't know about you guys, but studio apartment doesn't quite feel like it'll cut it. Now imagine the price of your water bill after you start pouring out huge buckets of Charlie before you go to bed and before you go off to work every day for Charlie to drink. <laughs> and finally, this is the best bit. Imagine how much Charlie is gonna poop and pee in one full year. <coughs> you need to think of a way to legally get rid of all that poop without clogging your toilet. Maybe you'll need a humongous compost bin uh, to dispose of one year's worth of Charlie's poop. I don't know about you, but that does not look fun. <laughs> you can open your eyes if you have them closed. So yeah, that's gonna be one smelly studio apartment. So put all those things together in your mind. Picture all that food, all that water, all that space, and how much poop there's gonna be. So that's everything you bought on Amazon for Charlie for a full year. Already seems overwhelming, doesn't it? It's gonna be one very expensive pet. Okay, now I just quickly wanna go back to that numbers into time visualization. So we calculated that 70 billion seconds equal 2,219 years. But now we're not gonna only just assign one Charlie to every second, we're also going to assign one Charlie the cow plus his supplies to every single second. So now each second represents Charlie and his one year starter pack. Every single second for 2,219 years. Can you visualize all those Charlies, all that food and all that poop? 
Take a second, really visualize it. Sounds gross now, I've said it out loud. <laughs> so that timeline of 2,219 years of one Charlie and one starter pack for every second is a visual representation of the impact that animal agriculture has on our planet. And that doesn't even include the marine life we catch for food. We'll get to that later. So bearing all this in mind, let's think about that first question again. What requires more resources? What would take a greater toll on our planet? Feeding 8 billion people or feeding 70 billion Charlies? We're not talking about all animals here, only the animals that are farmed specifically for food. So that's Charlie, his pig, chicken, and sheep friends. I want to go back to Charlie's studio apartment for a minute. Charlie's very smelly studio apartment. In actual fact, when we talk about how much space Charlie's going to need, we can't just think about how much space Charlie's going to need to live and sleep in. We also need to take into consideration how much land is needed to grow Charlie's food. Because I'm telling you now, Charlie eats a lot. Every single meal fed to Charlie has a footprint of its own. It needs land to be grown on, as well as water to help it grow, and energy to get it from the food farm to the farm where Charlie is. That is a whole lot of land needed just to grow enough food for Charlie. When we really think about the whole chain, the whole process needed simply just to feed Charlie, the pieces of the puzzle start coming together. And it starts to become clear why animal agriculture, how and why animal agriculture is the leading cause of habitat destru destruction, species extinction, ocean dead zones, and water pollution. One of the biggest analysis to date revealed that animal products, so that's meat, dairy, eggs, cheese, butter, steaks, provides just 18% of the world's calories. 18, one eight, not eight zero. But takes up 83% of global farmland. If we all switch to a plant-based diet tomorrow, global farmland use could be reduced by more than 75%. And that statistic encompasses everyone on the planet, including those who are currently starving and without food. If we all switch to a plant-based diet tomorrow, global farmland use could be reduced by 75%. That is an area equivalent to the US, China, the European Union, and Australia combined. And with the growing human population and demand for meat, we're going to need a whole lot more space. So, where are we gonna find this space? Raise your hand if you've ever seen a video on Instagram, or maybe even TikTok, of an orphan monkey in a barren, deforested area looking for his mum. No one, really? Oh, okay, here we have some hands. <laughs> or maybe a confused koala bear with burnt paws covered in ash, searching the scorched ground for her home where a gum tree once stood. I know I have. And I think Kim also understands what we're talking about here. Not only do these videos and images fill me with sorrow, but they also fill me with motivation, power, and even anger. Why motivation? Because what we eat can actually stop this from happening. Why power? Because what we eat can actually stop this from happening. And why anger? Because what we eat can actually stop this from happening, but nobody is talking about it. In the period between 2018 and 2019 alone, the Amazon rainforest lost over 6,100 square kilometers to, to make space for beef production. 6,100 square kilometers is equivalent to 1.8 million American football fields. Just the Amazon rainforest, just for beef production. In just one year. 
And so far this year, in 2022, Amazon deforestation is at its highest rate for six years. Not only do rainforests provide habitat and a home for billions of wild animals, but they also release oxygen and the oxygen we breathe and absorb carbon dioxide. Rainforests protect against flooding, drought and erosion. They are essentially the lungs and life force of every living being on Earth, including us. Now, many people claim soy production is to blame for deforestation, and you know what? They're not wrong. Alongside animal grazing, soy farming accounts for a huge portion of deforestation. But it's not all the tofu-eating, soy latte-slurping vegans who are eating all this soy. Charlie and his friends are. Only 7% of the world's soy is used directly for human consumption for food products like tofu, soy milk, edamame, and tempeh. Only 7%. So where is all the rest going? The majority, so more than 77% of the world's soy, is fed to livestock for meat and dairy production. But let's just say, hypothetically, we magically have enough land to house 70 billion charlies, or maybe someone's built a really, really humongous skyscraper, probably in Dubai, to house 70 billion Charlies and all the food that he needs. What to do with all the poo? Now just imagine how much waste 70 billion Charlies create every year. Aside from being pretty gross, it's also very dangerous for the health of our planet and for us. Research estimates that by 2030, the planet will be generating at least 5 billion tons of poop every year. And most of that is coming from livestock. Animal manure is often thought of as a non-issue because it can be used as fertilizer. But the rate at which the poop is coming in, using it as fertilizer is just not an option. 80% of the farms in the Netherlands produce so much cow poop that they can't legally use it as fer fertilizer. And in China, there is so much poop that more than half the freshwater lakes in China have become polluted due to manure, dumping, or runoff, which has led to a rise in diseases like cholera in many rural communities. In fact, what's absolutely terrifying is that animal waste dumping in waterways is disturbingly common among farmers. Now the picture that you're seeing behind me, on the left is animal feedlots for meat, and on the right is the lake that is produced, as you can see, very toxic from all that poop. And that's in Texas, I think. <clears throat> and the reason that this is so common is because the cost for some of the solutions, so including using animal poo to create energy, is actually higher than the cost of the potential fine that these farmers might get for dumping the waste. So obviously, understandably, the farmers tend to choose the more affordable option. This means that the once fresh inputs of clean natural water into the ocean is being replaced by flows of poop polluted farm runoff and on a massive scale. And the poop that comes from industrial animal farms is incredibly concentrated and incredibly toxic. When animal poop, any poop, is left to decay, it releases greenhouse gas, methane. And when it's first released, methane is 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And that potency lasts for 10 to 20 years. As you can imagine, by the time it wears off, it might be too late. And on a side note, methane is also the gas that is released by Charlie and his friends when they poop, or when they pop, and when they burp. <laughs> so as you can imagine, having poop in our water and degrading in our air is not only dangerous for our planet, but for us too. If you've ever unknowingly walked a pair of shoes into the house that has accidentally stepped on a dog poop, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Just a tiny piece of poop in your living vicinity and your nose will tell you everything you need to know. Studies estimate 
studies have repeatedly shown that people who live near industrial animal farms are at much greater risk of illnesses and diseases like chronic asthma, respiratory irritation, immune suppression, and even mood disorders due to the harmful gases released by the poop, including ammonia, nitrous oxide, and hydrogen sulfide. And when we start talking about the more developed country, the, sorry, the less developed countries, the problem gets even worse. There's been lots of discussions around the world and action about what to do about human poop in these regions. Lots of action on improving human sanitation. But with the human toilets taken care of, these people are still getting sick and even dying from diseases that should have been eliminated once their toilets arrived. And that's because many people in these countries still live in close contact with their livestock. So they are still surrounded by poop, animal poop. And this is a recipe for disaster. A cesspool for zoonotic diseases that can spread from humans via animal poop. These are the perfect conditions for the beginning of another pandemic. And the next one might be a whole lot worse than the one we just experienced. The consequences of waste dumping can be catastrophic, as you've already heard. Often leads to algae blooms, which can poison the wildlife with deadly neurotoxins, which can eventually end up on our plates in the form of salmon, sushi, and fish sticks. So thanks to all this poop, Eating marine life should probably be the last thing on our minds, but seafood consumption is consistently increasing. I want to go back to that 70 billion number that I was talking about at the beginning. This number that I mentioned is only the beginning of the problem. That number only covers land animals raised for food. This number does not even begin to cover the huge number of marine animals we eat every single year. Approximately 2.7 trillion fish are caught from the wild every year. That's up to 5 million per minute. These numbers are often underreported and so huge that marine life deaths are more often measured in weight. So, in 2018 alone, we ate 179 million tons of fish. That's about equivalent to the weight of one million jumbo jets every single year. And the rate at which we're eating sea life is literally killing our oceans. And when our oceans die, we die too. The oceans are home to up to 80% of all life on Earth. They absorb four times the amount of carbon dioxide than the Amazon rainforest. And up to 85% of the world's oxygen actually comes from phytoplankton from the ocean. The ocean is the world's biggest carbon sink. And per acre, marine plants can store up to 20 times more carbon than forests on land. Every single marine species, marine life and plants, play a vital part in the ocean's fragile ecosystem. And by fishing, we are interrupting that entire chain. On any given day, there are approximately 4.7 million commercial fishing vessels in the world. And many of these fishing vessels are bottom trawlers. I feel like bottom trawlers are, are the fishing industry's dirty, not so little secret. They're relatively unknown. I, ha I actually have t-shirts that say anti-trawler baller, which I think is hilarious, but nobody ever understands it because not many people actually know what a bottom trawler is. Bottom trawler nets are huge fishing nets that drag along the bottom of the ocean, and they basically catch everything in their path. The largest trawler nets are so big, they can swallow up to 13 jumbo jets. 
Think about how crazy that is. A fishing net that can catch 13 jumbo jets. Bottom trawlers, obviously, they don't just get fish, as you can see by this picture. They wipe out uh, 3.9 billion acres of natural seafloor habitat every year. And not only is this damaging for the ocean floor, it releases approximately 1.5 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide every year. That's almost double the emissions of the entire aviation industry in just one year, just from the deforestation on the ocean floor. And these nets are so perfectly designed to be incredibly effective, of course, that's what they're made for, to catch everything, and I mean everything. Studies estimate that up to 40% of all marine life caught is bycatch. That picture you can see behind me is a whale shark caught in a bottom trawling net. Bycatch basically means non-target marine life like whales, stingrays, dolphins, turtles, sharks. And more often than not, actually most of the time when bycatch is thrown back into the ocean, it's already dead or already dying. As an example, approximately 50 million sharks are killed every year just as bycatch. That doesn't include the sharks that are killed for um, fin soup. Is that what it's called? <laughs> Shark fin soup. Just from bycatch, 50 million sharks every year. And on top of this, we're removing all the marine life and replacing it with plastic. And it's not coming from where you think it's coming from. The ocean is not full of plastic straws, although I'm sure there are a lot of plastic straws in the ocean, but it's not the main source of ocean plastic. Actually, plastic straws make up only 0.03% of ocean plastic. While discarded nets, fishing lines, and fishing-related equipment now make up 46% of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And all the, the ocean plastic degrades into microplastics, which is eaten by the fish, and you guessed it, can end up in the food that we eat. So when we really think about it with all the other contaminants and the heavy metals, when we eat fish, we're essentially eating plastic and poop. But this isn't to say that the fishermen and the farmers are to blame. The system is currently set up so that there are financial incentives in place and subsidies for those who farm, animal, farm um, animals to produce animal products. So right now, the power and responsibility is in our hands to shift the demand and show farmers that there is money to be made in sustainable plant-based foods. I reckon you guys know this is coming by now, but the best way to support nature, embrace sea life, and keep our planet alive is to eat plants. And when we make this simple change that has a huge impact on our planet, we get the happy coincidence of becoming the healthiest versions of ourselves. A healthy whole food vegan diet is shown to have countless health benefits, including weight loss and disease prevention, and has been shown to be one of the healthiest diets on the planet. Sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Now, I've only touched on a few aspects of animal agriculture. There are countless environmental issues where animal agriculture is concerned. But instead of blabbering on any further, I want to give you guys some homework. Don't freak out. This is Netflix-based homework. These, the following documentaries have literally changed my life and can probably explain much more eloquently than I've been able to how urgent the problem is and how much of an impact our diets have on the planet. Okay, so go home, open your laptop and watch these four films. The first one is Eating Our Way to Extinction. This one, I believe, is actually available on YouTube for free and is narrated by Kate Winslet, so that's fun. The second one is Cowspiracy. That one is on Netflix. And I believe all of these documentaries have multiple different languages and subtitles as well. Some even have different voiceovers. 
The third one is Seaspiracy. And the fourth one, fourth one, this is kind of a bonus film because it's more to do with health and it's more fun. Arnold Schwarzenegger is in it. James Cameron's in it. The fourth one is Game Changers, also available on Netflix. When I, have heard, when I first heard everything that I've talked about today, I was mad. I was really, really mad. Who decided this was the way that we should be eating? Who decided this was economical, environmental, or even healthy? And who is allowing it to continue? Because yes, we do all have a choice, and what we eat really does matter most. But in order to know this, to be able to act upon it, someone needs to be talking about it. Well, now you know. Now you have the power. Not only to eat plants for the sake of our future, but to tell every single person you know. To shout it from the rooftops. You don't have to go out and protest or wear militant t-shirts about animal poop or cow's poop. You simply need to share delicious food with your loved ones. Spread the word with the power of food and show people that plants are as delicious, if not even more delicious than animal products, which I feel like these guys could tell you. <laughs> because together, we still have time. Not a lot of time, so we do have to act fast. But with the power of plants, armed with our knives and forks, ready to use our money as voting ballots, we still have time to save the planet. We all have a choice, and what we eat really does matter most. Thank you. <laughs>